Now two important things. Let me introduce you one of the, our first guest speaker. It is our pleasure to have Professor Marion Mecklenburg, formerly senior research scientist at the Museum Conservation Institute of the Smithsonian Institution, opening this symposium. Many people in this room perfectly know his contribution to our field and his efforts in trying to understand better paintings behavior and aging. After 20 years as a conservator in private practice in the States, he was trained as a mechanical engineer. Dr. Mecklenburg has devoted the last two decades to study the effects of temperature, relative humidity, conservation treatments, and chemical degradation on the long-term stability of cultural collections. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for inviting me. It's, um, it's quite an honor to be here, and that introduction is, is humbling, to say the least. This isn't my talk. Second slide. Okay. As, as a preface, I would like to say this, this talk is sort of a condensation of an awful lot of things, but I tried to read some highlights about things that would be relevant, even pertinent to the discussion about the Picassos. It's, uh, Laura mentioned that one of the things that's most important is understanding the construction of a painting, the materials that were used in the construction of the painting, and she's absolutely correct. Oh, this is critical in so many ways. There are many factors that can adversely affect the stability of a canvas-supported painting, and these include very high or very low humidities, very high or very low temperatures, prolonged exposure to high light levels, the choice of materials used, for example, the linen, the drying oils can come from flax and other plants. Some oils are more durable than others. In addition, the pigments can differ widely in the formation of durable paints, and we're going to talk about the effect of pigments to some degree. The other thing is that an awful lot, uh, when I say there's different oils, for example, the difference between safflower, linseed, walnut oils, those, those paints may have, uh, those oils may have some advantages, but for the m most part, oh yes, for the most part, the, the, the linseed oils are going to be the most durable. How the materials are used and in what layered conditions. Um, one of the most interesting things we found in the research is the fact that by using certain layers of certain colors and certain pigments, you'll find that you can construct a durable painting or it will not be a durable painting. And then conservation and treatment includes cosmetic, such as the cleaning as well as structural treatments and lining. So all of these things have an effect one way or the other. Mechanics. Over the years, there's been considerable research into the chemical and mechanical deterioration of materials used in making of cultural artifacts, including paintings on canvas. In general, we are more familiar with some of the chemical aspects of deterioration. Nevertheless, mechanical aspects are equally important. What I hope to demonstrate today is that by using mechanical testing, we're able to identify chemical processes. And this is one of the things that's turned out to be quite useful for us. The mechanical deterioration can be viewed as an assessment of the forces and deformations that paintings experience due to factors such as changes in temperature, relative humidity, impact and vibration, and if it is possible to determine the magnitude and direction of these forces, then it's possible to determine their effects. Knowing these factors affect the durability of canvas paintings makes it possible to compare these effects to the Picasso paintings under discussion in this conference. For a typical painting constructed using linen, hide glue, size, oil ground, and oil design layers, the forces from relative humidity have been well established. For example, at low relative humidity, very high forces are developed in the glue sizes or any other layer of the painting that is responsive to relative humidity. 
These can be a layer of paint that incorporates high glue in the mixture. The damage caused by this condition is typically shown in the images below. And here's a typical cross section and drawing of a, a typical painting with all of the materials that we've talked about. What you really can't see in the macro photo, micro photograph is the glue layer. Now, one of the most important things one has to understand is we call these canvas supported paintings. In reality, they are hide glue supported paintings. That is the actual support to these paintings, not the canvas. <laughs> For example, if we were to lower the relative humidity and cycle it from high to low, we would develop cracks in the corner of the painting, and I think many of us have seen this many times. In the lower right corner is the output of a computer model that predicts that this will happen. That model includes all the layers, the canvas, the glue size, the ground, and the painting. So we're able to distinguish what each layer is doing while this thing is being transitioned from one environment to another. And here's an actual results. And I want to spend some time on this slide. Laura chastised me for not, not, not spending enough time. The first thing I want to show you is just take a look at the actual painting. We can see buckling from loose keys and overexpansion. We can see cracking from lower relative humidity. That's these cracks right here. Okay, this, can you hear me? Is this on? That's right. Okay, this works. And then finally, uh, these cracks right here. These are important ones here. Now the reason those cracks are important, those cracks come from the expansion of a stretcher, when we key a stretcher out. Now I haven't seen a lot of these cracks in the Picasso paintings of interest in this discussion. So we can rule out expansion of the stretcher as being a potential candidate for what's going on here. This diagram is the most important one. There are four materials here, and this is relative humidity versus the force that's being developed when these materials are restrained. Now, this material is developing very high forces. That's the hide glue. As the humidity drops, that layer in the painting gets very, very tight. The paint and the grounds don't do much of anything. And the canvases, as the humidity goes up, do develop higher forces. So we can distinguish clearly which layer is doing what in a painting as the environment changes. And using this information, we can develop computer models that will help us determine exactly what's happening and when. <laughs> this is one of your paintings. This painting has glue size and it's falling apart, it's cracking. And you'll notice it has the cracking due to the low relative humidity. It has other cracking patterns and we'll talk about that in a second. And if you notice, there's not many cracks going along here in the, uh, the stretcher bar. The stretcher bar right there is actually buffering the environment, keeping the humidity more stable, and so it's not getting as dry and desiccated. This is real important right here. There's a tack on the stretcher right there. And this, this tells us something. It says that this could have happened if the stretcher were expanded, but it didn't happen because we don't see the related stretcher expansion cracks. So we know this is humidity related. And this painting is being damaged by low humidity, but it also has a considerable amount of glue in it. Now I suspect the paint film in this particular painting 
is pretty desiccated. Uh, it might even be lean. I'm not sure, but uh, being lean, it doesn't have a lot of strength. <laughs> now, let's look at the higher immunity effects. If the humidity increases, and for very high relative humidity, the effect of to induce very high forces in the linen or cotton canvas. If the canvas is restrained, there will often be no lasting damage. However, if the canvas is loose, the damage will be considerable, and we'll see this kind of buckling effect because the canvas wants to shrink due to the high humidity. And here's a pretty good example of what's happened. Moisture has condensed, run down to the bottom of the painting, it's caused the canvas to soften the glue size and buckle and cause the paint to fall off. And we're now talking about this environment right here. Now, <coughs> here's something that's important. We, we talk about humidity variations and oscillations. The question really is how much is too much and how much is not enough. We're pretty sure now that we can work between 30% and 60% very safely for almost all works of art. And that you have to exceed those environmental limits before you start really seeing damage. Vibrations. In 1991, there was a big study done on the transportation of works of art, and vibration studies were done quite extensively, both at the Canadian Conservation Institute and in London. And in both cases, paintings were actually subjected to a um, resonant vibration. That means that the frequency, the natural frequency of vibration of the painting was matched by the frequency of the transport system that was inducing vibration. And the results were startling. No damage. In fact, we couldn't damage, know how we couldn't get cracks to grow any further. And that the only time we ever saw damage from any kind of vibration was when the painting was extremely loose and it was flopping back and forth on the stretcher bar. Impact, on the other hand, can cause severe damage by simply dropping the painting, and that'll damage the painting and the frame. So we can rule out vibration in general. Temperature affects a whole other bag of worms. In general, low temperature can have beneficial effects. It reduces chemical activity, mold growth, and slows moisture diffusion. The slowing of moisture diffusion is really something we ought to think about and talk about in a minute. However, if low enough, the temperature can pass below the glass, glass transition temperatures of the paint and cause serious cracking. For acrylic paints, the glass transition is about 10 degrees Celsius. For the oil and alkyd paint, it's around zero degrees Celsius, around freezing. In general, high temperature is hazardous to paintings as it seriously increases chemical degradation, including hydrolysis, increases moisture diffusion, and the higher humidity promotes mold growth. And so we know this. The big Tab taboo about the low temperature for us is going to be don't go below the glass, glass transition temperatures. And that's going to be the real issue. Now, let's talk about something. Humidity vi variations and temperature variations and rapid changes. There are lots of discussions over the years about rapid discussions, uh, rapid uh, variations in humidity and temperature. First of all, let's take temperature. The dimensional response of all cultural materials to temperature is minimal. And rapid, vibrate, rap, rapid change in temperatures don't do anything to the art. Rapid humidity changes are slightly different in so that these things are responsive, but moisture diffusion is slow. And if the moisture doesn't have time to absorb and desorb from the materials, then very high uh, frequency cycles don't mean anything either. 
And in fact, one of the great studies that was done in Poland was showing that panel paintings can take months to come to equilibrium with a change environment. Right here we have a computer model that has all layers and it's showing the change in temperature. And the question is what are the resulting crack patterns that we should see from temperature results? The fact that it's a uniform green means that the temperature is telling us that the stresses and forces throughout this painting are fairly uniform. Now how does this differ from humidity effects? It's much more damaging. The picture on the upper left is actual crack pattern developed by the computer model and subjected to low temperatures. The actual painting shown on the right was damaged by low temperature and not a severe change in relative humidity. In fact, research is now showing that low temperature is most likely the cause of much of the damage seen in the collections in the eastern United States, particularly in 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century paintings. Other factors of stability in paintings. These include the pigment volume concentrations, planing lean, and I suspect Picasso painted lean from looking at his paintings. Other paints can cause, uh, the low PVC can make the paint, paint films brittle and weak. Equally important are the paints used in the making of the painting. Here we're gonna enter a realm that was only recently we talked about at the, uh, 2010 cleaning conference in uh, Valencia. Let's, let's talk about oil paint, the manufacture of oil painting and the formation of oil paint films. Right here I'm showing you an 11 year old unpigmented cold pressed linseed oil. And if you were to touch it, it would still be tacky and gooey, nowhere close to being dry. Now, <laughs> let's add some pigment. This is the same oil, it's the cold pressed linseed oil, and it's been mixed at a standard pigment volume concentration that would make a paste paint, and it's been mixed with basic lead carbonate, or white lead. This is the stress strain diagram taken as time goes on of this oil paint. As you can see, this painting is getting stiffer and stronger, stiffer meaning it's getting steeper and stronger meaning the stresses to failure are getting higher. Now, do all paints do this? And the answer is not even close. But this diagram, this stress drain diagram gives us very huge insight as to what the effects of pigments are in the manufacture of oil paints. For example, let's look at lead pigments. These are different leg pigments, and you'll see that over time, these paints are not the same. In fact, this paint down here, the Naples yellow, doesn't develop any strength at all, even though that paint is 17 and a half years old. And you say, how can that be? Well, it tells you something about the drying process. First of all, a pigment has to produce metallic ions to form a durable film with oil paint. If you can't dissolve the pigment in the acidic oils, you won't form a film. Well, what other pigments do we have that will never do that? Well, the organics, and the organics are notorious. The alizarins, for example, and they will never form a very, very durable film. Inert pigments, there are certain pigments that were used that will never form films. And look at all these calcium carbonate, barium sulfate, silica, and uh, silica cold pressing. So this is interesting, silica. You know, do you know of a pigment that contains silica or silica? It would be smalt. Even though it has cobalt in it, it's still a glass cobalt. And it never does form a, a very durable film. So we now are having some insight as to the materials used and what we can expect from them. On the other hand, zinc oxide can be a real hazard. Here we have some images of titanium and uh, zinc pigments, uh, paints. 
Look at this. Let's take the titanium first. This is eight, eight and a half years right here. After 17 years, we have decomposed down to this paint here. And why is this a problem? The, the reason this is a problem is with the restrictions on the use of lead carbonate, other white paints had to be found, and one of them, of course, was titanium. Titanium does not form a durable film. So what are they going to do? Well, they started mixing it with zinc. Well, let's see what zinc does. Zinc starts here at about eight years, and about 14 years later, it's getting very stiff and very brittle. And we're going to show a picture of the mixture of these paints. So mixing the paints doesn't necessarily produce a durable paint. And this is what zinc does in time. It not only cracks, it delaminates. This is a 20th century painting and uh, English abstract and the owner graciously allowed me to, uh, she, she showed this picture. But uh, zinc oxide was available from the mid 19th century, but I don't think it was really used that much until the beginning of the, probably the 20th century. This is an interesting case, and the reason this is particularly interesting is because this happened while the owner was handling it. This painting is a mixture of, uh, the paint film is, is linseed, is uh, oil paint and solvent-based uh, uh, acrylics, like the Beaucourt Magna Colors, and then it's on an oil ground. The owner of this painting took the car in Buffalo, New York, the painting from her house to a car in the middle of winter time, and the painting cracked just like that. And that's what happened. They passed the glass transition temperature. And so we see what the model says. We're going to see cracks running this way. In the, the second thing that happened to this is after the, she got it in the house, the painting started delaminating. And that's because of the zinc ground. So we know exactly what happened to this painting, what caused it, and why, and what the materials were. In fact, we predicted what the materials were before we really knew, once we saw the pictures of what was going on. Mechanical properties paints with copper are typically pretty strong paintings. These are, almost all of these will be durable paints, and we see that in the paintings themselves. None of them uh, are in poor condition. Hydrolysis of paint films. This is one of the things that we're, we found out about the paints once we started testing. When we saw that paint films were not forming durable films, we had to find out why. And one of the reasons is hydrolysis. And the important thing about hydrolysis, it can occur even in a benign environment. It's moisture attacking the paints. <laughs> For example, let's take raw and burnt sienna. The iron oxide paints are problematic. Let's start here with burnt sienna. One and a half years old, it's very stiff paint. After eight and a half years, look at this, it's hydrolyzed already in eight years. The same thing has happened with the raw siennas. It started off looking very good, and then over time, it collapsed. And this is why this painting looks the way it does. What's interesting, and these are the lead whites, these are the earth colors. And Matteo Rossi Doria was kind enough to send me this picture. But one of the things that's of interest to us here is you'll notice we see no ground under this. It means there was no underpainting influencing the upper layers. And the question is, would it be possible to have underlayers affecting the upper layers of the painting. And one of the most important things we found out is that if this painting had been grounded in a white lead ground, none of this would have happened. Ions from the light wet, white lead would have migrated and stabilized this color. Raw umber and cold in uh, burnt umber do the same thing. So all the iron oxides are problematic.
yellow ochre, another one of the uh, iron oxides. And this is plain iron oxide. So the, these paints are problematic. Where do we see these paints used? Well, in the Mediterranean basins, Venetian paintings, Titians, we're gonna see a lot of those earth colors used in the paintings. And if you notice, some of those paintings look poorly cleaned, and that's because these paints are not durable enough to take figures cleaning. Other paints are hydrolyzed. These would be the um, organics. And you can't even distinguish, they're just lamp black, very poor. Cadmium yellow, loses all its strength. In addition, of dryers can cause problems in paint film formation. This even includes naturally occurring minerals such as manganese dioxide, which is also found in mined umber. And the, dramatic, the results are dramatic. <laughs> These are different paints with different, magne, different quantities of manganese found naturally in the paints. And look at this paint. It's extremely stiff due to the manganese. And that's a picture of that brittle paint right there. It's almost as brittle as a zinc. In fact, it's, it's, it'll crack just on touching it. And these are all different paints of different time spans with different quantities of manganese. And the more time and the more manganese we have, the, the, the more brittle the paint becomes. So analysis, I think Laura mentioned it. We have to understand the materials. We have to understand the analysis of the materials, what's really in them, if we want to understand what the painting is going to do. And mixing together, and we're going to end with this, I believe, we had three paints, and we simply mixed them together. They were flake whites from Grumbacher, and they had uh, zinc and lead carbonate in them. And we mixed them with paints we knew, like iron oxides, that we knew were poor dryers. And the end result was is expected. And it wasn't much. We didn't need much, only about a quarter or 20 percent. And we find over time, if we compare the pure uh, alizarin against the mixed alizarin, there's a much different behavior. So that white lead is really helping these, make these paints durable. This is terra verde mixed with a 20% of lead. And we can see over time, even a very short period of time, it's becoming a durable paint. Ochres, same results, short period of time, very durable paint. This is the mixture against the pure paints. We suspect now that you don't need much of the paints to mixture. Uh, Lead, lead was thought to be a good um, uh, uh, sicative or dryer, and one of the lead sicatives was litharge, and lit, that's a lead oxide. The trouble is, it makes paints extremely brittle. These are a mixture of titanium and zinc. This is what a modern day paint manufacturer is experimenting with to try to find a substitute for. Um, white lead, and these are the pure titaniums, no strength at all. These are the pure zincs getting brittle, and these are the mixtures in between, and it shows that very little zinc mixed into these can cause a huge impact on the effect of the mixture of the paints. Conclusions. Departures to the extreme high and low relative humidity levels can certainly cause damage to canvas paintings, but in reality, most paintings can successfully sustain changes in their RH range from 40, 30 to 60 percent. The primary support of canvas paintings with high glue sizing is the high glue and not the canvas, and it's also the high glue that is the most responsive to the environment, so we really have to pay attention to that. There's little support in the paint film from a canvas in a, a paint, uh, painting that has no or very little high glue sizing the paint is now lying directly on the canvas, and it, the support is almost the paint itself. Low temperatures can be beneficial to the painting unless the low temperatures get below the glass transition temperatures, and high temperatures are always hazardous to paintings. Uh, all kinds of chemical reactivity, and I think Oscar Kigantori is working on some of those things. He's here today. Paints made from certain pigments, such as earth colors, organics, colors, and certain inorganic pigments will never dry to form durable films. Other pigments such as zinc and umber containing manganese dry to extremely brittle films. 
mixing white lead even in small amounts will enhance paints made with poorly performing pigments. And with that, I want to say thank you for the time. I know this is short, um, but you have just gotten kind of an overview of things we're pretty sure about right now and given an idea of what's, what's possible. And I think that's the most important thing. Thank you very much. Thank you.